Yeah. And it's showing. Okay. Um, I'll I'll just do a little bit of background and thank you everybody for coming on and attending this webinar. Um, it's it's very welcome to get members of the industry, um, technology academics, um, thinking about this particular area. Uh, and we're focusing today on the salads sector. So um, I and my colleagues at AgriEpi and others have been working um, hard over the past number of weeks to identify and uh, promote the um, ability of automation to try and alleviate the concerns in the salad sector. So um, I'm grateful um, for um, input today, particularly from uh, Grimmy, uh, our, our co-presenter Rob Wilkerson as a panellist, uh, and Bo Lee from University of West of England to uh, help and assist uh, on the both the, the commercial side of uh, things and on the the sort of the academic challenges associated with this particular sector. So I'm just going to launch into my presentation now um, and uh, give you a little bit more of the background. Um, so the we I think it's fairly obvious to everyone that, that COVID has had a major impact upon all sectors um, and in particular. It's had difficulties. Uh, we're aware of the, the, the food sector, particularly having to pivot very quickly um, uh, from, um, you know, hospitality and catering into into retail. But there, and, and that's created a bit of price volatility. But other things have had secondary impacts, and one of the secondary impacts has been the availability, the ease and availability of labour um, in 2020 uh, for. A whole range of different um, uh, picking, harvesting, etc., um, uh, requirements in the industry. So that's been one of the drivers that, that's um, allowed us to, uh, not allowed us, but has focused our attention on trying to come up with other solutions. Uh, we've got uh, obviously a number of different um, campaigns that are that are ongoing at the moment, and there's the national campaign Pick for Britain, which was launched a few weeks ago. Uh, which is try to try and encourage UK uh, citizens to come uh, onto farms and harvest or tend to pro uh, fresh produce uh, over the course of this season. Um, the, what we're finding, and it would be useful if anyone has any up-to-date information who's on the webinar today, um, we're finding uh, in an anecdotal analysis of that campaign, there have been many instances of uh, what we call ostensibly huge take up where people register. But what we are finding is the retention rate is not as high as people we might expect it to be. So what I mean by that is um, the people who do turn up or um, register and, and attend um, do not continue to attend for a period of time. And that then puts pressure on, again, labor requirements on particular commercial businesses. Um, and then we've got another, um, you know, post-COVID or possibly still within COVID um, in season 2021, um, there is a Brexit um, exit at uh, December the 31st. And we're not exactly clear what the um, final arrangements might be negotiated for labour and uh, Eastern European particular migrant labour in the UK and what that those limitations might express in terms of um, issues for particularly harvest, et cetera, for um, horticultural crops. So that's another perceived pressure, which may turn out to be reality. So 2021 may be a challenging season. And uh, again, it would be useful in any chat or any feedback from people in the sector and industry today to give us um, a, any of your thoughts and feelings as to how you perceive that risk going forward as well. Um, so I'm just going to dive into the, the topic of the day, which is the salad sector. And I'm initially focusing on um, whole head well lettuce as one of the major um, contributors and give some facts and figures. So um, just a quick series of graphs here to show the, the, the size and the shape of the industry and the trends over the past few years. So um, the, this is the, the production over the past eight or so years or so. I don't have quite have the 2019 data yet, the end of, but um, DEFRA stats, these are from DEFRA's own, own uh, 
accounting system. It shows a, a general, a slight reduction in trend in overall lettuce production in the UK. Um, and on the import side of the equation, you're starting to see the balance of that, which is um, a gradual and incremental increase in imports over the similar time period. So um, that's that's not the best of news, but um, it just sh it shows in stark reality what where we sit in terms of volume. But in terms of value, uh, it's a slightly different story. Uh, the overall value has um, certainly over the past uh, 15 years or so, um, and that's uh, that's welcome. And if we look at the value of imports, they've increased um, quite significantly, certainly over the last 20 years. Uh, the value of that has increased significantly. And um, in actual fact, well, that's more recent data, some more near recent snapshot, but our lettuce exports um, are fairly flat over the period. Um, just to give you an idea, the dates are obvious on the bottom. The um, y-axis on all of these graphs is in millions of pounds, just to give you a, an understanding. Um, I, I'm, I'm putting in tomatoes here. It might not be the central topic of today, but it just is another significant commodity that requires significant labor. I uh, just wanted to show a, a bit of information, background information on the UK position on tomatoes. These are mainly heated in glass houses, but uh, you can see again, the, the a, a bit of a trend downwards from UK domestic production and a balancing trend upwards from from imports. So we're not quite holding our own in um, UK tomato production, uh, and it's a very high value commodity. So what I want to do now was um, is part of the wider um, exploration of automation solutions. I wanted to reflect on some other things that um, we're looking at or are happening elsewhere uh, globally in other sectors to give um, some context to what we want to talk about today. So uh, this is looking at field veg, in this instance, um, I think it's broccoli, and looking at some solutions there. There have been attempts at some mechanical solutions. This is a few years old, but this is from Tasmania company in Tasmania, which is, uh, came up with a, a mechanical solution to um, uh, broccoli harvesting, but more, more a, in fact, what you would call a slaughter technique, which is harvesting everything in, in its path and not non-selective. Um, in terms of selective, there have been um, um, some um, successes uh, in, in terms of prototypes. Here's one from RoboVeg in the UK. Um, and in other sectors, um, looking at um, asparagus, uh, again, there have been some successes. This is a New Zealand um, system, which is automating asparagus harvesting, uh, which is quite interesting as well. And there are other, other aligned um, technologies which um, are useful in particularly selective harvesting, where um, pre-harvest scouting can uh, uh, be adapted to uh, provide the intelligence for um, harvesting product at the um, retailers um, or close to the retailer specification requirements. So you can get a map of where you need to pick uh, in terms of uh, your harvest, your ongoing harvesting. And this can be advantageous for both manual and automated harvesting. And this is an example from Earth Rover. Um, if we look at um, the Raspberry, Area. So there's some developments happening there. Um, there was this um, mechanical rasp harvester that uh, did produce what I call table level um, raspberries. Uh, it did, it's a mechanical technique using a series of brushes, soft brushes, uh, and, and uh, uh, manages to get the fruit away from the vine. Uh, but it's not ideal um, and it doesn't create the highest quality. Um, and there are developments in the UK. This is fieldwork robotics to look at individual uh, robotic mechanisms to harvest uh, uh, raspberries. So there have been developments in prototype form, at least uh, in the UK, on raspberries. Um, if we move to uh, strawberries, so there's been quite a bit of work in this area, and especially in the UK, which is really gratifying. Um, 
So we have a couple of companies. Uh, the first one is uh, Saga Robotics in the UK, which is a collaboration with a Nordic company. But it has come out with um, a platform device to both assist in harvesting, so it provides the mechanism to remove product from the field and get it to uh, a processing line or packing line very quickly and works in harmony with the picker. And it also um, has um, attachments that are in prototype form at the moment that actually mechanically harvest individual uh, strawberries. So there are, there are um, developments from the Saga end. There's another company called Dogtooth, which uh, uses um, a polar axis robot systems to harvest strawberries uh, in the in the, traditionally they're now growing in in, in polytunnels. So this system is uh, very close to um, uh, series production and has been tested. There's been a number tested in in the past few weeks, and it's looking very promising. So the combination in the strawberry area there there are some promising um, uh, progress, shall we say, within the UK. Uh, in the commercial sector to try and produce solutions. Um, the salad sector, so um, uh, this again is focusing, I guess, on, on whole head and selective, but there, are, there have been, uh, there have been some international um, progress on mechanical solutions, and I've just identified this one, which um, is being tested in both California and Australia, and it's based on a, a, a harvester system that uses, in fact, water jet cutting as the mechanism to um, remove the head from the, the stock. And uh, I'm not sure, I've not had many reports on the, the absolute success of these machines yet, but at least they're looking at this, and there's still a requirement for labour in terms of um, uh, grading and selecting on the machine. Uh, uh, but it does reduce the labour requirement um, significantly. I think it is requiring possibly only 30 percent. I may be wrong there, but around, around 30 percent of the traditional labour requirement to harvest the same volume. And more recently, um, I think uh, uh, this was done at Cambridge University. Uh, it was a prototype. Um, uh, the students, uh, uh, I think, contributed heavily to this, and it's um, a a prototype in 2017, 2018, 2019, I think it worked, ran through. And uh, the big um, veg producers in the UK um, were, were supporting this. And this is something called VeggieBot. And uh, again, I think in prototype form, it was fairly slow in picking, um, but it was a welcome um, in innovation to try and identify a solution for um, certainly whole head harvesting. Uh, I brought in, in the bottom left, I brought in a tomato harvester. This is one from Israel, uh, automated tomato harvesting system, which is, um, uh, I think, at final prototype stage or maybe started to go commercial. So there have been some developments in the tomato harvesting arena as well. So for now, if I can move on to what is the challenge and really to try and get some um, feedback, interest, discussion in the chat and the Q&A session at the end. Um, just to set another bit of context here, if we look at the, um, and again, this is, again, I'm, I'm making no excuses here, the big, one of the big markets is in whole head lettuce. So the UK market, as you remember earlier on from the graphical representation, is around 0.1 million tonnes. Uh, the global market's about just under 30 million. The Chinese market in itself is quite surprisingly about just under 50% global lettuce uh, production. And the Euro main European markets, Spain and Italy, are about 6% of global production. And why, um, talk, why, why these numbers are mentioned is uh, the... Am I being heard? Here we go. I am being heard, I think. Uh, why these numbers are mentioned uh, is to give a context of if we develop something or if something is developed, there is a market um, elsewhere and that market can be captured. So there's not, there is a UK focus at the moment and a UK issue, 
but for any manufacturers there's obviously a bigger market to capture now i haven't at all focused on other salad sectors um what are the challenges relabor and are there potential solutions there what technologies what solutions could actually be implemented for those other sectors that currently are have, have or may in the future have labor issues in terms of um, growing and harvesting the product of the field so again um, an, a basic question to and a challenge to everyone who's an academic or technology company um, who's listening to this uh, webinar do we have the capacity to the event that's um, that's just a Poke, poke stick question um, and are there companies on the webinar and beyond that can offer early stage agritech harvester pick solutions again a question to the audience and what do we need to do what things what developments need to happen um, obviously engineering design manipulation robotics etc but a lot of the technology revolves around artificial intelligence and machine vision systems and that's one of the core technologies I think we need for the sector to, um, to operate and develop um, commercially acceptable solutions. There are companies uh, that um, are willing to provide platforms, service and support, and will and um, I'm sure that Grimmy and Rob will, will um, answer that point. And can we do this? What resources are required? Can we um, look at the combination of the industry itself? Uh, is there any other support that is required or le needs to be leveraged to make this happen? And what should be the priorities going forward? And this is my end finally. Uh, so the, uh, we've been running a series of um, webinars um, across the industry. And I would imagine that some people who are on this webinar would have attended those other ones, the wider ones. Uh, and there is another one on this, uh, it's this Thursday at two to three o'clock. Uh, Agri Epicenter are not running that web, it's been run by the KTN. But if anyone wishes to jump onto that wider webinar, uh, which will include some of our potential sponsors, people from DEFRA um, and Bayes, etc., who will be attending, um, you're welcome to contact Simon Beatty at KTN, and Simon will uh, get you registered and get you on that webinar. So as I say, it's this Thursday, the 25th at 2 to 3, if anyone is interested to find out more and find out more about the wider sector, wider horticultural sector in terms of automation. Um, and at that, I thank you. Uh, I just point to, uh, well, my email address possibly, but um, more related to inquiries, agriepicenter.com, and Annabelle and colleagues will pick up anything, uh, any questions you have after this webinar, etc please uh, don't hesitate to just pop an email and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Okay, that's me finished, Annabelle. Thank you very much, Dave, that's great. I'm now gonna hand over to Rob Wilkinson. I can okay. see you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, just to give you a quick introduction, my name is Rob Wilkinson uh, and I'm the Vegetable Product Specialist for Grimmer UK. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Grimmer, um, they're a harvesting specialist company uh, with a, a global presence um, and they're very well known for uh, production of potatoes and handling equipment. Um, and uh, my job within Grimmer is to, I'm responsible for everything that isn't potato. So what we, what we class is the, is the vegetable side um, of the business. Um, and what I'd like to do is I'd just like to give a quick introduction um, as what it is that we do and what Grimmer are very good at doing. And hopefully that will lead into where, we, uh, where we're offering um, our capabilities and we're looking for support from uh, other providers. Uh, and suppliers. Um, so um, I've just chosen uh, cabbage harvesters uh, as one of the examples. Uh, Grimmer do a, a number of harvested solutions for different vegetables um, and I've just chosen cabbage uh, because it's been around for a while and it's a very good machine that uh, we're very proud of um, and I'd just like just to show you what it is that we do. So um, 
what we have here is, is we have the harvesting section for cabbage and this harvesting section is uh, capable of, of harvesting uh, processed cabbages but also fresh cabbage as well uh, without damaging the crop. Um, it has a number of options so we can change the options on here to handle different crops in different ways and in different conditions and in different farming situations. Uh, but this is a very uh, fast and effective harvesting solution. Uh, it has the ability to harvest around a cabbage a second. Um, so it's a very effective and, and um, uh, viable solution for farmers. Now, what we can do is, is we have a, a piece of te harvesting technology like this. What we uh, do is, is we can put that harvesting uh, solution onto many different machines. So, for example, that one harvesting solution can be used on a mounted cabbage harvester. So that's mounted to a tractor. Um, and in the case on the picture on the left, uh, it has a box at the back. And for fresh cabbage, what will happen is, is there will be one or two, two or three people on the back of that machine hand loading into that box to minimise damage from loading into boxes. Um, we can up the capacity of that uh, by looking at the picture on the right and we can have an elevator solution loading more boxes on a trailer at the back of that harvester. Uh, again, using the same pickup section, uh, we can do other things as well. So the picture on the left there, you can see that that is actually an automatic uh, loading solution. And uh, what that will do is, is, is it eliminates labour completely. All you need is a driver on the seat and somebody to unload and unload the boxes. Um, and that box at the back can tip up um, and all the cabbage goes directly into the box. And again, that can be used for fresh cabbage as well as processed cabbage. Um, the solution on the right, uh, this is a little bit more tailored towards processed cabbage, but the harvesting section is exactly the same. So what we have is the harvesting section, which goes into an elevator, which then can be loaded into trailers or boxes um, along the machine. Uh, on the side of there, we can even put that same harvesting section, we can put this on a trailed uh, machine. So this is a machine that's trailed behind the harvester. Um, once we go to a trailed machine, we can start actually, actually using multiple rows uh, so we can actually have uh, up to two or three rows harvest at one time at this point. Um, again, that can be fresh cabbage loaded into boxes or uh, different methods, or it can be loaded straight into a trailer. The picture on the right for processed cabbage, we can load straight into bulkers, uh, which again ups production time. So you're, you're minimizing the stop time in the field, um, which is a key, key driver for a lot of customers. Um, as I said there, uh, we can go into a multi-row machine. So there you can see there's a two-row machine. Um, and as I say, we can elevate into bulkers or into trailers. Uh, on the right-hand picture, you can see that there are solutions there for cleaning leaves and taking leaves away from, from uh, the cabbage. Um, in some cases, we do have people on the machine uh, hand sorting, uh, but that's not always necessary. It depends on the variety of the cabbage. Um, then we can take that same harvesting solution. So we're still focused on that one harvesting solution. And you can see here that we can go right up to large self-propelled machines. Now these large self-propelled machines can load straight into trailers. Uh, we can go straight into boxes. There are multiple different options uh, that we can do. Um, but it's all focused around this one harvesting section. So what we're saying is, is that, um, especially with farming, it is not a one size fits all. Um, every farm, well, most farmers in the UK will want their own solution. They will want something bespoke. They will have a different growing method to other farmers. Um, so what we can do is, is if we have a harvesting solution, as in, for example, this arm, we can tailor and change that solution to suit the farmer. Um, so I'll just, um, uh, okay, um, sorry. 
Um, so what we can do is, is so we can, um, and, and what we're doing is, is we're reaching out. Um, we have a number of farm, uh, harvesting solutions. We have a number of platforms that harvesting solutions can be used on um, existing, but we also do a lot of bespoke. So if we have a harvesting solution, um, we can build bespoke uh, platforms for farmers, for uh, whoever it, we, we need to be. And at the moment, we're working on a number of uh, projects for bespoke one-off projects. Um, and we're developing our own solutions for some crops as well. Um, now, what we have realized is that when it comes to certain um, uh, vegetables, and, and I'm classing lettuce in here, is that we need that out of the box thinking. We need that next level of technology, which we don't have the capability uh, within Grimmer to sort of develop ourselves, and we don't have the, the resources to do that. So what we're doing is we're reaching out to yourselves, to the growers, to the, to the people who are willing to work with us on their crops, or if you have a harvesting solution, we're willing to work with you and offer you um, our existing portfolio of machinery, um, and help you develop and get a route to market. Uh, one of the things that we do see when we speak to farmers, uh, especially farmers that have had technology providers uh, on their farms and work on their farms is that we seem to get to the prototype stage, but it never seems to go to that next stage of production. Um, and what we're hoping to do is, is that we're hoping to give you the uh, facilities and the, the infrastructure to as a route to market and get that next step. Um, we have the service background, we have the route to market, and we have the parts, uh, parts network to support products out in the market. Uh, if something is successful, uh, as we said, Grimmer is a global company. So if something is successful and can be proved to work, um, it would easily be ad adopted by other parts of Europe and, and, and the world. Um, so, but what I would like to do is I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to uh, be shown um, that some of the things that I, what's, what's the barrier to market for some of uh, you, the companies out there? Um, because some of the things that we see is that some of the, 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 the solutions that are developed, they're slow to harvest. Uh, so they're not actually a, a viable solution for a farmer because it's not quick enough to replace existing methods. Um, so there's a little bit of a lack of efficiency there. Um, it needs to make financial viability. So the cost of some of this technology is very high. How can we lower some of that cost to make it uh, affordable to, to the end user? Um, we have to understand that it's not a one size solution fits all. Uh, so, as I said, different farmers have different growing methods and different solutions that they're looking for. Um, how adaptable are some of these methods? And also, can they work in different, different environments? Um, as some of you will know, you'll go to different crops in different parts of the country in different weather conditions and the, the whole characteristic, characteristic of that crop changes. So how adaptable are some of these uh, technologies that are out there? Um, so I'd like to understand what some of the barriers are for the companies that are, are, are trying to get things out there and is there anything out there that we can assist with and help with. Um, but my challenge is, is to, uh, as, as Dave said, our challenge to you is, is what have you got? Can you prove to us that there's something out there that can work? And like the cabbage harvester, if we can prove that, then what we can do is, is we can turn that into a, a viable product for an end user. Um, so thank you. I think I'm probably under time there, but uh, uh, thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Rob. I will now hand over to... Yeah. Can you see it? I can see it, yes, that's great. Okay, all right.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just a brief introduction of myself. Uh, my name is Bo Li. Uh, I'm a lecturer in the uh, uh, Center for Machine Vision in Bristol Robotic Laboratory. And uh, so today I would like to give a brief introduction about the, our work in precision agriculture. Um, so I'm currently based in Center for Machine Vision, uh, which is part of the Robo Bristol Robotics Laboratory and uh, is jointly funded by uh, between UB and the University of Bristol. So in, in BRL, uh, we, can, we conduct uh, different aspects of research uh, regard in, in terms of the, the robotics uh, industry. Um, so for the Center for Machine Vision, uh, for, for the past few years, we had a lot of uh, precision agriculture projects we applied different imaging technique, including uh, 2D, 3D, multispectral, hyperspectral, and the deep learning method. And we worked together with the industry partner and produced a lot of IP rated uh, near commercial pro uh, prototype, which can be potentially converted to commercial products. Um, so most of the agriculture product, products, uh, so projects was from the Center for Machine Vision. But I just want to mention that we have uh, all expertise for the robotics industry in BRL. So I would like to take this opportunity to uh, understand the current challenges of cellular industry and, um, and um, use all our ex expertise to contribute in this, in this area. Um, so with the image analysis uh, technology, we already uh, completed several uh, projects before uh, in different aspects of precision agriculture, including uh, crop grading, uh, crop yield forecast, uh, wheat detection, uh, uh, quality measurement internal or externally, and high throughput disease detection. Uh, out in outdoor field. Um, so I'll give some examples for this uh, this technology. Uh, so this is the the weight detection. Um, so it's quite difficult to use the normal RGB imaging with traditional image analysis to accurately detect the location of weight. Um, so we apply the deep learning method not only detect the location, but also we can quantify the size of the, the weight. And this information can be very important to supervise the, 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 the chemical screening. And uh, we expect that we can save uh, between 50% to 95% of the herbicide use. And uh, this can save a lot of money to, to farmers. And uh, so this is a course near commercial and is funded by Innovate UK and uh, Soil Essentials Limited as the commercial partner. Uh, so Harvest Eyes, so we work together with Grimmy and, and uh, Branston. So we developed this uh, machine vision based grading system. Uh, it's also used uh, RGB imaging, uh, low cost and, uh, and uh, uh, deep learning methods so it can accurately count the number of potatoes after harvesting uh, with higher than 90 percent accuracy and also it can measure the size of each potato for the grading purpose uh, so it can be installed in the existing harvester and so it's can so it's very near commercial where which can be uh, directly used in the field Uh, so with deep learning and RGB image, it has a. Uh, we also use that for the tomato uh, project, so it can accurately uh, measure the number of the the the, the trusses of tomato. So for previous image analysis technology, it can only uh, count the number of big tomato, but it's it's difficult to measure the number of the small tomato. But for, with the neural network in deep learning, we can accurately measure the number of different types of tomato. And uh, with each rectangle, uh, we can also uh, assess the color of the tomato to determine the ripeness. So this is quite useful too for the 
yield forecast in greenhouse. So <clears throat> 2D imaging is low cost and uh, uh, it's easy to set up, um, but 3D imaging can give more details on the surface or the texture. Um, so take this one, take this uh, as an example. So we developed the 3D uh, imaging for potato and uh, mushroom. So based on the uh, the, the normal uh, the no normal information, the 3D imaging can detect this curve and the uh, the, the symptom of the disease, which cannot be detected easily by 2D imaging. And uh, because th this is 3D images, is based on a uh, photometric studio and um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, binocular studio imaging, so they are still easy to set up and um, low cost. So with different uh, 3D imaging technique, also we developed the, the 3D uh, strawberry phenotyping platform. So mainly this, this one is used for the uh, strawberry breathing uh, because, for the, because for, for the manual assessment is always time consuming and uh, uh, expensive because you like the harvest. So labor is quite um, difficult to get during the summer busy period. And uh, for the benefit of 3D imaging is that it can generate multiple external uh, parameters. And for some parameters such as volume and uh, calyx size, aching numbers, they are, they are nearly impossible to be measured manually. And especially for, for if you want to measure thousands of strawberry each day. And uh, so for all these parameters, it can measure at one time. Uh, so we further developed this platform uh, last year, and uh, it's because we recognize that the, the the shape uniformity is also very important for breeder and also the the producer. So from the three D model, we can measure the sh the shape from the side view and the the top view. Then we can use these different Im images to quantify the uniformity. And uh, the similar technology has been applied to potato tuber as well. Uh, but moreover, for potato, we developed image analysis software to quantify the number of potato eyes. And also, we can measure the depth of the potato, potato eyes. And so this is, can be quite useful for the potato breeding, breeding as well. So uh, this, is, this is the collaboration between uh, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, so funded by Newton Agriculture. Uh, new agri-tech in China large ground. So this is so this is quite a good project for uh, after the uh, international collaboration. Um, so so for the, for the 3D and the 2D imaging is can be a good pro, uh, technique for the external quality measurement, but uh, people are also interested in the internal quality measurement, especially for fruit. And so we developed the, the, the spectral imaging. Uh, so for this one, it's hyperspectral imaging for food quality assessment. And uh, so based on, so it's hyperspectral imaging basically measure 2D uh, imaging at different wavelengths. So it depends on what hyperspectral camera you use, the, the number of the bands can be, can be between uh, 30 to uh, nearly 300. So, uh, so with with a uh, higher resolution of the spectral information, the more detailed information you can get for the uh, color for the visible and the infrared region. Um, so, based on the difference of the spectrum, the hyperspectral imaging can measure uh, the fruit ripening, uh, sugar content, um, firmness. It can also detect latent bruising. So from, for this example, we can ma uh, accurately measure the dry, mat the dry matter content and uh, the, the firmness of plum.
so we also apply the hyperspectral imaging to detect the, the, the properties from the canopy. And so for strawberry, we detect the drop stress and uh, uh, we also use hyperspectral imaging to measure the nutrition and such as the, the nitrogen uh, content. Uh, early detection, even though it's not that visible, but uh, the, the, the hyperspectral imaging can enhance the contrast between the diseased area and healthy area. So the drone is, is becoming more and more popular, especially in agriculture. And uh, so we, we face the different imaging sensor, including RGB, uh, multispectral and hyperspectral to the, to, the, to, the, to the drone. And so this is the example we apply the drone-based imaging on potato research. Um, so we use this, uh, the drone platform to monitor the potato growth at different um, growing stages. So at the early stage, we use the drone to measure the potato uh, emergence rate. So even, so basically we want to count the number of uh, plant, potato plants, uh, even though they have some overlap on the canopy, but with the machine learning method, we can still accurately uh, count the number of uh, potato individual uh, potato plants. So with the uh, hyperspectral imaging and the multispectral imaging sensor, we can measure uh, more about the more canopy trees, especially for the nutrition uh, properties. And so these two images basically, basically shows the the spectral information at 400 and 800 nanometers, and uh, it can measure different uh, nitrogen status, uh, so which is quite important for the to supervise the the fertilizer application. We also find that with the multispectral uh, image analysis, uh, the biomass, the above ground biomass, can be very accurately measured. Um, because so the reason we want to do this is that for traditionally biomass. Uh, it's very important for the, 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 the plant growth monitoring and, and the traditional data it is measured in the lab uh, based on the destruct, destructive measurement. And uh, so with the UAV imaging, uh, it can measure the biomass at a at very short period of time. And so it's, it's, it's much cheaper than traditional, than traditional method. Uh, so we also apply the UAV multispectral imaging to, to measure the strawberry disease. So for the verticillium dali disease, and uh, the UAV imaging can quantify the, the resistance or the symptom uh, in, in, in half an hour time. So this is this, there are around 2,700 strawberry plants. So it's, it's, it's looks, it's much, uh, objective uh, than the manual assessment. And the manual assessment normally take a few days time and uh, not accurate. Yeah, so this is, so for this presentation, I just give a brief introduction for the, uh, for some, uh, um, we, we have to keep the, the key technique confidential for some reason. Uh, but uh, basically, it's just give a brief introduction to all of you about what we can do. And uh, so basically, in C uh, the uh, Center for Machine Vision, we work with our industry partner to develop the prototype system for plant uh, recognition, uh, localizing and uh, assessing the plants in real time. And uh, we, we are very interested to apply this technology from indoor to outdoor, which is more practical. Uh, uh, for the uh, complex um, uh, condition. Um, so just as I mentioned brief, uh, before, uh, we have the expertise of the whole BIL and there's a lot of uh, interest from BIL to work in agriculture sector. So we, we have a lot of expertise in the robotic hardware who can deal with the, the platform vibration, uh, changing light and changing perspectives. And uh, 
with the link uh, with the linked uh, to the 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 whole BIL, uh, we are very interested to develop the the hardware such as the robotic arm for the automated pruning, spreading, and the harvesting. Um, so we are very keen and confident to work with uh, uh, commercial partners for the knowledge transfer, and we are very experienced to develop the IP rated. Uh, commer the, the commercial pro the prototype. So I hope this helps for all of you to understand what we are doing and what we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Bo. I will now, um, we will now go to the questions and answer session. Okay. Okay, so we have a question that's come in, which is, what are the challenges that need to be overcome from a machine vision and AI perspective? Um, Bo, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so we have a so so like the CMV, we have developed different imaging technology. But uh, for us, the main challenge is that we need to have a good connection with the, our uh, industry partners, especially like the grow the growers, to to have a further validation of the imaging technology. So that I think that's the whole point of this webinar. We want to bridge the gap between uh, engineer and uh, and the commercial partner then we can understand the main challenges and we can develop the imaging technology specifically for certain application and we can have the opportunity to validate the technology so i think this is quite important for us okay brilliant um Sorry, one for you, Dave. Um, it was, did lettuce grafts include baby leaf or just whole head at the beginning of the presentation? Um, the, the, the figures um, for baby leaf in terms of volume are a lot less than, than uh, whole head. Um, I didn't include the baby leaf figures in terms of gross value added or output from the UK. It's, uh, it's probably less than 10% of the, of the value, it's a, but it's, uh, it's that's off. That's farm farm gate level, uh, but that's a that's a fast growing market. Um, and uh, again, the baby leaf uh, mechanized harvesting for baby leaf is fairly well, unless someone on the webinar tells me otherwise, um, has has the, the, the fairly refined solutions for baby leaf. Uh, it's a slaughter harvester technique and a very short cycle uh, of of production. But uh, no, the figures did not, um, as far as, away, as I'm aware, I think, include baby leaf. I can double check, but I don't think they were. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we've got, why is automated harvesting more difficult for, say, lettuce and cabbage? Uh, but Rob, do you want to have a first go at that one? Uh, so maybe Rob, is it? Yes, you are the best person to answer. Yep. Okay. So it's it's down to the the tenderness of the crop. So lettuce uh, to hand to mechanically handle a lettuce without damage is very very difficult. Um, so whereas a cabbage is a little bit more robust, um, especially a processed cabbage. Um, sometimes with cabbage, they they can sustain a little bit of damage, especially when being loaded. But if it's going to the fresh market, that's fine. Sometimes a lot of the cabbage goes to storage. Um, so any damage over a period of time actually uh, the, uh, the damage, uh, rots, the, rots the cabbage. Uh, where with lettuce, um, we, can't, we can't tolerate damage uh, practically at all. Also, uh, things when it comes to like an iceberg lettuce, the specification from the supermarket is very, very fine. Uh, the difference between one or two leaves being left on the bottom of a, a lettuce can be the difference between a fail and a pass. So 
in very tight specifications when it comes to harvesting. Okay. Um, what are the difficulties in going from a prototype to a fully engineered commercially available solution? How can we avoid falling into the same trap? Uh, I, I, I'm a bit tag team this one with Rob a little bit and possibly Bo. I think I think that that's part of the purpose of this webinar is to connect as many elements of the supply chain in terms of product delivery as we can um, so that everyone who's in that supply chain can provide the technology, the innovation, but there's also the refinement, the process of delivery, the service and support, et cetera, et cetera. That, that, that has been a traditional failing. Um, there have been, I mean, I can personally elaborate on why the, there are structures within the R&D funding landscape that probably do not help that particularly at present, and we, we need more late stage um, development um, resource in order to carry these forward to, to production submission. But that's for beyond today. But I wonder if Rob would care to comment on the, the idea of, um, of marrying the, 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 the resources that possibly Grimmy might have in order to mitigate against that risk of what we call the, is it the, the valley of death, I think some people call it, from prototype onwards. So one of the things that we, we see is that um, actually getting something to harvest in a field is one thing, but actually get, making that a viable solution for an end user, for a farmer, a grower is, is another thing. Um, and one of the things is that uh, many farms have a solution for harvesting in place at the moment. To get them to move away from that um, is a very challenging thing. And, and having some technology that can harvest quickly and efficient, efficiently without damage is the challenge. Um, and it's, it's, it's bridging that gap from it being a working solution to a viable solution, uh, which can be very difficult. Um, and, and for example, there on the cabbage harvester, um, you have to be harvesting at the at minimum of a cabbage a second to um, keep up with a, to make it viable for a farmer to replace labour. Um, and if you can't do that, then why why would the farmer bother investing vast amounts of money in technology? Um, so it's understanding what the farmer is and making the technology be able to do that. Bo, have you anything to add on your experience in terms of getting things to near production um, with some of the relationships you have with some commercial entities? Uh, so we did a lot of Innovate UK, Innovate UK products before. So for a lot of products, we, we found sometimes, for, for especially for the university or, or, or research institutes, we have a very uh, limited knowledge in the marketing things. And uh, we do need to understand the what's what's the real challenges is for for the for the grower, and uh, so we can develop the prototype uh, uh, in 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 controlled environments uh, easily. But uh, we do need a lot of resource from grower or or, or industry partner to further improve validate and the in, and the further improve the, the the prototype. So I guess, as you said, for the funding, so this is very limited funding to support this stage, actually. So we have a funding for the proof of concept. We have the funding for the prototype development. But uh, mm -hmm. after that stage, there's a lot of good idea just, just to stop. OK. OK. Um We've got um, are hydraulics suitable for speed in the selective harvesting, or should we be looking towards more electronic actuators? Um, I wonder if Rob, would you want to try and think about the answer to that question? I have some thoughts as well, but um, from your perspective of what historically you've achieved so far, and what you might think for more um, uh, uh, what we call. Um, gentle, I suppose, handling of produce? Yeah, I think uh, you, you, you can get finer movements and control with electric actuators. Um, sometimes if we have a high electrical demand in a field, it can be sometimes difficult to, to supply that, um, but it can be overcome through different methods. Um, 
but um, on, our, on some of our machines, we use both. We use electric actuators and hydraulics. So um, I think there's a place for both in, in different situations. Okay, uh, boy, anything to add on that? Uh, no, I think I think it's good for Rob's comment. Okay, uh, I'll add it. I'll throw in pneumatics as a potential alternative as well, as as a number of people are using pneumatics as a as an intermediary, relatively low cost um, method of uh, providing mobility or actuation or um, automation in in a, a number of different developments. So pneumatics may be another consideration that does offer does require another another um, source of um, compressed air that a number of people are looking at. Okay, great. Um, this one is uh, sort of for you, Rob. It is about um, are Grimmy asking for help or are you offering help? That's a question that's come through. So if you could just sort of discuss how, what's the next steps really? Okay, so we recognise that there's a demand, um, especially in the solid sector, and what we'd like to see is, is with, well, both really, we're offering um, anybody who has an existing technology that can prove to us that it's um, it's effective and it can be scaled. Um, if, if that can be proved to us, then we're, we're offering to help uh, take it to the next step and do field trials and, and whatever else it is it needs to be done. And if that's successful, then as, as we said, we have a route to market and we have a, um, a network um, of service and aftermarket services to, to support any product. Um, so again, it's, it's the, answer, the, the answer is yes to both of those. Uh, we're asking for help if anybody has any solutions out there, but we're also offering help to, to make that next step. Um, does that make, did Dave, do you want to elaborate on that any? Or? I no no I'm fine with that uh, uh, Rob I, I I don't want to advocate on behalf of Grimmy but I think from from a agri epicenter point of view we'd be delighted to to interface help or assist if there's any other um, technology or equipment or resource required um, please use us to signpost to assist in any any um, development that you may have and if it can assist Grimmy and get to their business solution that that's 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 one of our you know one of our targets for today okay great i think we've just got time for one more question we have got lots more but you can ask these after the um webinar so the last one is um how can deep learning and machine vision help with automation for the salad sector well that's an obvious one that's Bo, please <laughs> yeah uh, so so as i mentioned we don't have a lot of experience in seller industry so we we have a lot of experience in, in top fruit soft fruit and like a uh, uh, potato and also like wheat and barley but uh, we do feel that all this technology can be transferred to the cellular industry so we use this technology for uh, like the 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 the, the yield forecast so we can count the number of cellular plants we also use the spectral imaging for the disease early disease detection and uh, the biomass uh, measurements uh, without any destruction in a high throughput way and uh, we do use the hyperspectral imaging or other or even multi-spectral low-cost multi-spectral imaging to measure the, the the crop quality so this this is quite a good question because we really want to understand what's the main challenges of cellular industries so this is this is the the whole point of 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 the presentation and uh, so but we do feel that with deep learning we can mainly we can do the counting and uh, the recognition of the object you are interested in. and uh, once you can localize the object we can they use different technique like a 3d imaging you can measure the the external quality spectral imaging um, for the for the internal quality as well or color analysis so um, i think there's a there's a lot of things we can do just based on our previous imaging technology okay that's great um what we will do is we are running we've now run out of time for questions so any of the questions that we haven't had a chance to answer today we will be able to answer those offline and if anyone does want to get in touch with any of the speakers we'll be very happy to facilitate that 
um, and work with you to sort of set up some meetings as well and take it forward. You will all receive a recording of this presentation as well. So um, on behalf of Agri Epi Centre and all of our speakers, thank you very much for listening in today and we hope you have a good rest of the day. The webinar will now close and thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.